God is good, brother. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't it good to be together, man, praising the Lord? Hallelujah. Well, I thank all of you, man, because, listen, it's your heart to praise that, that usher them in. So I, I thank God, that's for sure. Man, when you meet with God, there's like nothing compares with that, right? And you sense that those times when he just comes in, man, it's just so awesome. So I, I kind of just want to start out. I'm going I'm to open up in prayer in a minute just to thank God. But tomorrow, uh, excuse me, not tomorrow, this Monday night is our prayer night, 7 o'clock at night here at the church, like 7 to 8. Um, we'll have our prayer, our prayer meeting. And then um, the, the shirts built by God. Paul, stand up for me. You'll be my shirt model. <laughs> <laughs> what is it with guys man if, we, if we're called to model it's like we got to dance or, and we can't dance so it's like well some of us can't some of us can or if we put on a pair of gloves whatever whatever kind of gloves they are well, all of a sudden we're boxers <laughs> it's like my wife gives me cleaning gloves and it's like all of a sudden I'm a boxer right? but yeah it's funny hallelujah so we only have a few XLs left I think like three or four, man, they kind of sold out really fast. Um, so Pastor Sway is going to do another order. So if anybody wants one, just let him know so he can kind of get your size for you. They seem a little, what's my, it's, yeah, small size. Like if you take a large, you might want to get an extra large. I was an extra large. I had to get a, a 2X. And then I figure once you wash them, it's going to come out, right? I think they're polyester and cotton or something. But um, amen. And so we're just going to... Uh, Open up in a word of prayer. Father, we just come to you right now, God, and I'm just so thankful, Lord, that we have you. And God, you remind me every day that when things are, seem to be getting out of control or we just feel like, God, what is going on? And you remind me every time with that scripture that we use a lot of times at funerals or encouragement is we don't sorrow like those with no hope. I, I want to paraphrase a little bit. We, we, don't, we don't get angry like those with no hope. We, we don't stand in fear or worry like those with no hope because we serve the God of hope. And so, Father, we, we serve you. God, what's the worst thing they can do? Take our life? So what? Paul said to live is Christ and to die is a gain. So, Lord, we, we just look to you, God. Lord, bring back to the saints in the modern church what the early saints had. Lord, they didn't count their life as, Paul said, I count my life as dung that I may win the high calling of, the, of my calling of the prize, high prize in Christ Jesus. And so, Father, we, we come to you tonight, Lord, and we just say thank you for being God. Thank you for being in a great and merciful and wonderful and gracious God that brings hope in hopeless situations, Lord. You bring joy in a sad situation, God. Lord, you turn on things around, Father God, and, and so fast, Lord, and that, God, we're, we can go from sorrow to joy because you said weepings for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. And so, Father, we thank you that you turn my morning into dancing again and again and again and again and again, Lord. How many times in my life you've, you've turned it around, Lord. So, God, I'm so thankful that we have come tonight, Lord, and, and the word and the series you gave me to be built by God. And, Lord, that's what we want to be. We want to be built by God. Because when we're built by God, we're built for eternity. When we're built by God, we're built to last. When we're built by God, we're built by him, and he covers the past. Come on, somebody. When you're built by God, he takes you into your destiny and your future, no matter what you've done in the past. So, Father, I thank you, God. I thank you, Lord, for covering us, for loving us, Lord, when we weren't lovable, God, and for not giving up on us, Jesus. Thank you for not giving up on us, Lord. And even at the times that, Lord, we, we act like little brats, Lord, you still love us, Lord. Thank you that you said you'd never leave or forsake me. So, Lord, I have no plans of leaving or forsaking you and not in my own strength because you gave us the comforter, the another comforter, the Holy Spirit, so, God, we thank you tonight. Lord, let your servant be anointed of you, Lord, just one more time tonight, God, that I can honor you and, Father, encourage my brothers and sisters that, God, that they will know that they are built by God and they are built for eternity. They are built to last. They are built to make it through storms. And so, Father, we thank you and we praise you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. 
And everyone said amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Man, you can feel that excitement in here tonight, man. It's, it was during practice we could feel it. It was just like, man, amazing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So, yeah, it was, a little, it, was a, it was a rough day today. It was, you ever have one of them days where just everything seems not to come to fall in place? <laughs> but amen. But you know what? I wouldn't trade it if God shows up. That's all that matters, right? But I'll open up in the verse. This is built by God. This will be the last part of this series, um, part seven. And so um, Psalms 127.1, and I'll be reading mostly out of the Amplified uh, Version. It saves me a lot of breaking down Greek words. But it says, except the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. The word, the word vain there means empty. Right. So those they labor, their labor is empty if they're trying to build it. If we're trying to build ourselves in God, you're, 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 it's vain. It's empty. We just turn to the Lord, man. And, and just yeah, I was talking to, to somebody the other day, not not from our church. Um, and they were just talking about, you know, how there was a young guy and he, and he had a calling on his life. I, I met him and he, and he was he was just saying, you know, I just want to be perfect. I want to do all these things, you know, and he had such a heart, you know. But I saw such a like a struggle in him that he was so worried about it. And I, I said, brother, do you know the verse Philippians 1, 6, man? Be confident in this one thing. If you're going to be confident in something, be confident in this one thing, Jesus said, right? That he who begun the good work, he who begun to build you, he's going to complete it until the day. So God's building it, right? All we have to do is cooperate. So I don't, I, it kind of takes all the pressure off of you, doesn't it? And kind of puts it on God, but God doesn't receive any pressure. He can do whatever, right? He said, all things are possible, only believe. So except the Lord builds the house, they labor in emptiness. Who build it? Except the Lord keeps the city, the watchman wakes, but in vain. We can put all the guards and sentries we want. But if God ain't in it, it ain't going to happen, right? So we've been reviewing how God can and does use our life, right? He uses our circumstances, um, even negative things, right? We've seen through the story of Joseph and even with David, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, Job. I mean, we can just go, anyone that's, if, if you read the Bible, right, anybody that's been used mightily of God, how many know has gone through some hardships? There's nobody in this Bible that was used mightily of God that didn't go through some hardships. So, so we understand. And when I first got saved, the kind of the message I was receiving, not necessarily maybe that's one, what, what, that wasn't what they were necessarily saying, but what I received was, is once you come to God, all your problems are gone. It's fixed, man. He's going to fix everything, right? <laughs> that lasted about a day. <laughs> then God started working on me. <laughs> and then everything changed. You know when he starts pruning? <laughs> yeah, that's not always comfortable, but it's what we need, right? So we looked at the portions of, of primarily in this, this series with David and mostly Joseph, and we've seen and, and how Joseph was built by God or is being built by God, we'll conclude tonight, but, um, and that God had a bigger purpose in his life, even through the, the trials, the circumstances, right? Um, sometimes we go through things and we don't understand how anything good could come out of it, right? But then we see, and even in the story of Joseph, I believe every one of us can relate to some portion of Joseph's life in, in this series that we went through, right? That we can all relate in some way, and I believe that's why God used this, so we could relate to it. And that God had a bigger purpose than Joseph even realized himself. And we're going to see that tonight, where kind of really, when it kicked in for Joseph, we know he knew something, right? Because he was trusting God the whole way, so he had to believe and trust in God. But there's something that happens, and, and it really kind of, I don't want to kind of get ahead of it, but so he's given a dream by God at a young age. He was seven, about 17 or younger, and that his family would bow down to him as one in authority over them all. So the younger to rule over the elder wasn't even a good biblical concept back then, right? It was usually the elder or that the elders. But here, this young man, Joseph, at 17, is when he revealed the dream, doesn't necessarily know when he got the dream, but that he would have this authority. So what was their response? What was the family's response to that? Well, you, you can just talk out loud. You don't have to raise your hand. 
They were resentful, right? What else did they do? Angry? 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 Okay, so they were angry. What's that? Jealous? They actually used a word that begins with H. They hated them. That's a strong word, man. I, you know, before I was saved, I used to say that a lot to people. Like, if I didn't get my way, I hate you. <laughs> you know? But then after I realized that, and then the Bible says, you know, don't, don't say you hate your brother. You know, it's, I was like, ooh. Yeah, I had to, I had to repent a lot, Paul. You with me, buddy? <laughs> it does. It's like when we used to tell people to go certain places. And after I got saved, I was like, I had to correct. I had to make some major corrections. <laughs> they got mad and they hated him to the point of wanting to kill him. Right? That's why God says, be angry and sin not. Like, there's things that go on in life. And it's okay to get angry, but it's not okay to get angry and sin. Right? So we reign it. Because there is a righteous anger, right, that we can have when you see certain things happen or, you know, people getting, you know, mistreated or things. You know, I'm sure you can think of a million things, but... So they decided to throw him in a pit to die. Then they got this idea to sell him into slavery. And again, he's 17 when he was sold. And so he was sold to, to these traders. And then he was sold to Potiphar, right? And then he, he was raised up in the Potiphar's house to become the leader or the ruler in Potiphar's house. Now, and remember, Potiphar was like the general for, for Pharaoh. He was like his security general. This guy was like important. And so Joseph is raised up and he's put a ruler over this guy's house of everything that he had, the Bible said. And so he became this leader and then Potiphar's wife, you know that story, right, came on to him and tried to seduce him, set him up and over time kept trying to do it. And Joseph, she sends all the servants out, gets him alone in the house, sets him up. And so she tries to, you know, come on to him, and, and he takes off. She grabs his coat, you know, basically cries rape. And um, so she tells her husband and the rest that, you know, he tried to, this Hebrew tried to rape us, rape me. And then so he's thrown into prison by Potiphar. Normally he would have been killed. But I believe Potiphar maybe had some doubt, right? Something was going on. But he had to do something so he didn't lose face for who he was. So his life is spared, but we know who spared his life, right? It was God. God. God spared his life. And so he then becomes the leader in prison. He becomes the under warden, <laughs> right? I mean, this is amazing if you think about this story, right? I mean, this has to be God, right? And so he, he becomes basically the warden, and he's put over all the prisoners. And we talked about how Joseph, his heart was one to serve. He's a type of Christ. So even through his being mistreated, he still remained a servant to others. And Jesus said, the, the one who's greatest among you is a what? Servant, right? Serves others. Even Jesus said, I didn't come as one to be served, but one to serve others. So he gets this, these butler and the baker come in. If you remember that, we talked about that, I think that last week. And they come in and they, they have these dreams. And they don't know what these dreams mean. They were very troubling to them. They came to Daniel. Daniel tells them, my God interprets dreams. Daniel interprets the dreams for them. They, the dreams come true. And so they, he said, remember me when you go, when you're released to the one. The other one's going to be beheaded, exactly what happened. And it says that he forgot Daniel. So then Daniel remains in prison for another two to three years, and then we're going to see what happens. And, and Joseph is a type of Christ in a lot of ways, and, and in the sense of living for God and overcoming all the obstacles that, that he faced He's a, a type of Christ in that he serves others. He's a type of Christ in his heart of forgiveness, right? How he, how he forgave, forgave others, didn't hold an ought. And you think about Jesus on the cross, you know. There's so many types here to, to, to remind us of, of Christ. He remained faithful to God. And he was seeing God's faithfulness, mercy, love, protection, correction, and direction in his life, Right? And isn't that what we want? We pray that all the time. I pray all the time. God, give me your direction, protection, and correction. Because I need all three. You know? and, and his correction is even an invitation to come closer. It's not to, to put us down or, or, or break our spirits. Now let's look at the bigger purpose God was using Joseph to fulfill. So Joseph's now about 30 years old. And he's the most powerful man in Egypt. 
next to Pharaoh. Remember, he got appointed, and now he's, Pharaoh brought him out. He had, Pharaoh had the dream. He interpreted Pharaoh's dream. Pharaoh appoints him up over all of everything that he owned. And so we're going to pick up the story where um, Joseph's uh, father, Jacob, and he's, they're, they're, the famine's taking place. So we're going to go to Genesis 42, 1 through 9. And I'd encourage you to read this whole story, man, from, from beginning to end, because I'm really going to be jumping over chapters um, just for the sake of the teaching. But um, So Genesis 42, 1 through 9. And it says, When Jacob learned that there was, no, uh, there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? For he said, I have heard that there's grain in Egypt. Get down there and buy grain for us that we may live and not die. Now, before I read the rest, remember that this famine, that seven years of famine, right, that it was prophesied. Jacob was one of the number one cattle barons, if you will, right? So he had a lot of livestock. Well, the livestock needed grain too. So you're talking about losing everything it's, and their lives on top of it. So evidently the sons are kind of sitting there twiddling their thumbs and Jacob's like, what are you doing standing around? Like there's grain in Egypt, go get it. So 10 of Joseph's brethren went to buy green, grain in Egypt. He kept the youngest Benjamin back. But Je- Benjamin, Joseph's full brother, Jacob did not send with his brothers for he said, lest perhaps some harm or injury should befall him. He already believes he lost one son. He believes Joseph's dead, right? So the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those who came for there was hunger and general lack of food in the whole land of Canaan. Now Joseph was the governor over the land. Now Canaan is the promised land, right? We all understand that. Now Joseph was the governor. So that's the people of God in Canaan. Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's half-brothers came and bowed themselves down before him with their faces to the ground. Now I want you to think about that. He's He reveals the dream at 17. Don't know when he got it. But he reveals it at 17, so we'll go off of that. Now he's 30 years old. This is 13 years later. God gave him a dream, and now 13 years later, and think about all he went through before that. And, and, you know, I think it's just encouraging because a lot of times we pray something and it doesn't happen right away, right? A lot of times we pray for healing or we pray for this or whatever it may be that we're praying for or a breakthrough of some kind and and it doesn't seem to happen and sometimes we we grow weary and we give up, don't we? It seems like everything else is going the opposite direction than what we're believing God for. But we got to hold on because, you know, I think about how many times somebody may have quit or I may have quit right when my breakthrough was coming. You know, you think about Daniel, man. What if he'd have quit right before? What if Joseph would have took an attitude and chopped his brother's head off right now? And he would, have, he would have foiled the whole plan of God that was going to happen very, very soon. He was this close, right? And I wonder how many times we're this close and the, and the enemy gets us to, to get discouraged and, and, and quit. So it says here that Joseph was the governor in verse 7. Joseph saw his brethren and he recognized them, but he treated them as if they were a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. He said, where did you come from? And they replied, from the land of Canaan to buy food. Joseph knew his brethren, but they did not know him. And Joseph remembered the dreams he dreamed about them and said to them, you are spies and with an unfriendly purpose, you have come to observe secretly the nakedness of the land. Very, very interesting I love that part there because it says, and Joseph remembered the dreams that he dreamed. So Joseph, Joseph now, he's been through all the things that he's been through, been holding on to this dream, and now he's standing there and he sees the dream revealed right before his eyes. Now Joseph, man, he could have got revenge. He could have killed them all right then and there, right? But, but he didn't have that heart. And it says, he, but I love when he said he remembered the dream and, and why I'm pointing that out, because when I read that, that he remembered the dream and, and he saw the dream now come to fruition that God had given him. And to me, what it does, and you help me, you know, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but when he saw that manifested, to me, it had to speak to him to know that God was being providential in his life all this time 
that he had waited for this dream. And, and then think about all the, all the heartache, all the hardship, all the sadness, man, the, the loneliness, being separated from his father and his father thinking he's dead and no one coming to rescue him and being in a strange land. And th just think about all the emotional roller coaster this guy had to go through. And now all of a sudden in a moment, the dream that God gave him is coming to fruition. He had to understand that everything that happened to him was in God's providence, right? I mean, this is just amazing to me because it's easy to say after the fact when we see the answer, but it's not so easy sometimes when you're going through it, is it? When you're in the middle of the fire, it's not so easy to, to sing praises, is it? But we have to. Joseph remembered these dreams, and, and I, I, now Joseph... I, I kind of incorrectly, I said he was 30. He, he's actually 37 to 38 years old. So it was about 20 to 21 years that, that this happened. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, but talk about cheerful, patient endurance. This guy is like, he's got it, man. Not one time did Joseph lack faith in his trials or fail to trust God. Not one time. I mean, think about that. And he's got me beat already. <laughs> they tell Joseph, we are not spies, but we've come to buy food and we are your servants. The whole thing back to the dream, right? And Joseph basically starts getting a little stronger. He says, no, you're, you, you're up to no good. And they said, no, we're, we're servants. You're, we're servants. We have 12 brothers of our father, Jacob. And he says, our, our youngest one is with our father, but one is dead. Now, I thought about that, and I was thinking, okay, why is Joseph now kind of being a little tough on him, right? Like, because I, I, I was thinking about that. It's like he's not, he's not holding a grudge. So, so what, what, what is he doing? So I kind of, let's go on a little further. In verse, uh, chapter 42, go up to verse 15, and we're going to read 15 through 24. He says, you, you shall be proved by a test. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go away from here unless your youngest brother comes here. That's Benjamin. Send one of you and let him bring your brother and you will be kept in prison that your words may be proved whether there is any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh you certainly are spies. Then he put them all in custody for three days. And then Joseph says on the third day, do this and live. Interesting third day, right? He says, I reverence and fear God. If you are true men, let one of your brothers be bound in their, your prison, but the rest of you shall go and carry grain for those who, we, who were weakened with hunger in your households. But bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified and you shall live. And they did so. And they said one to another, We are truly guilty about our brother, for we saw the distress and the anguish of his soul, and he begged us to let him go, but we would not hear him. So this distress and difficulty has come upon us. Now that didn't say in the story when we read it back when Joseph was thrown in the pit that he begged him to let him go. So this can kind of gives you a fuller picture. So here he is, this young 17-year-old, pleading with his own brothers to let him go, and they won't hear it. They just ignore him, and they, walk away. they sell him into slavery and walk away. So keep that in mind when we're reading this, because it's kind of bring to life everything. So he says, bring the youngest brother and you shall live. He did that after the third day. He put him in prison for three days and then he released him. I mean, think about the analogies of that pertaining to Christ. And they said to one another, we are truly guilty. Their, their conscience starts to come alive. For we saw the distress and the anguish in his soul when he begged us to let him go. And we would not hear him. So this distress and difficulty has kind of come upon us. One of the things I found out in my life is when I'm guilty of something and something happens, I'm always guessing, is it because? Right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Is it because? Huh? Yeah, consequence. So the consequences of the choices that they made, they, they sinned against God. What they did was totally wrong. But all these years, they've kept it and they've been able to live with themselves. But when they get before Joseph and Joseph starts to do these things, their conscience comes alive. 
Now, keep that in mind now. And then Reuben answered them and said, did I not tell you? Remember, Reuben's the one who tried to spare his life and save him. And Reuben says, speaks up and says, didn't I tell you not to sin against this boy? But you wouldn't listen. Therefore, his blood is required of us. They're starting to get really scared right now. <laughs> they didn't know that Joseph understood them for he spoke through an interpreter. So he's speaking to them through an interpreter, but he understands every word they're saying. And he turned away. Listen, now listen, look at the heart of Joseph because earlier it seems like he's being a little harsh on them, but look what happens. And he turned away from them and he wept. Then he returned to them and talked with them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. And Simeon was one of the leaders of, of wanting to kill Joseph. He was like the ringleader of it. Now he's going to be put in prison and the other brothers have to walk away. Do you see this illustration of what they did to Joseph is what is now happening to them again. Except this time they're not in control of it. Now they got to go back and answer to the father and say that he got Reuben and now we got to bring back Benjamin, your other son. And, and we're going to see kind of what happens there. But when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, man, God is using Joseph to see their consciences pierced. And at first, they may, maybe they, didn't, they seemed a little callous, but then when he's heard them talking and realizing and their conscience starting to be pricked, I believe he turned and wept because I believe he was rejoicing part of him that, man, their hearts are getting tenderized. Because if you don't yield to the conviction of God, you'll get hardened. You're, you'll sear your heart. You'll sear your conscience. If you keep, listen, I, I, I did it before in my life before I was serving God, but I knew there was a God. I was in church as a little boy. But, and I would do things, man, and I would, you know, you think it's your conscience telling you no, right? And you just keep going through it. I don't care. I want what I want, right? And it's like being an iron man on your conscience and your soul and your heart. And it just gets calloused, man, over the years until Jesus comes in. He's the only one that can cut off that callous, man, and take that heart of stone, right? and make it a heart of flesh again. And so we see this playing out, man, and it's so amazing to see this whole story the way it looks. So we, we see the consequence of their sin has come upon us, Reuben says. They returned to tell their father all that happened, and, and his heart just sank. When he's going to talk to Joseph, you're, you're going to see. And he says, I've lost Joseph, and now Simeon's in prison, and now you ask of Benjamin? Now you're telling me to give, me a, give him another son? This would be the third one. So at first, Jacob says no. That's why I said you've got to read the whole story. But J Jacob says no, I'm not sending him there. And Egypt was a picture of corruption, a picture of the world. And if they went there, they'd be corrupted, maybe meet a girl, marry somebody that wasn't a believer, that, that whole thing. You know. And they also knew about the prophecies that the Jews were going to go into captivity for 400 years. They also knew that. So remember, they got all this in their mind, and now he's being asked to send another son into Egypt. So think about what's all going through Jacob's mind. Let's go up to uh, 45, chapter 45, verses 1 through 13. It says, Then Joseph could not restrain himself any longer before all those who stood by, and he called out, caused every man to go out from him. No one stood there with Joseph, now, remember, they came back before him. I know I warped up through, but while he made himself known to his brothers. So the brothers, Jacob at first says, no way. And then he says, okay. And he lets them take Benjamin back. So now they're before Joseph. I probably should have filled that one before I read the verse. Now, Joseph could not restrain himself any longer before all those who stood by him. And he called out, caused every man to go out from him. So no one stood there with Joseph while he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept and he sobbed aloud. And the Egyptians who had just left him heard it. And the household of Pharaoh heard about it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? And his brothers could not reply, for they were distressingly disturbed and dismayed at the startling realization that what they were in, Joseph's presence. And Joseph says to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father alive? And then verse 4, and Joseph says to his brothers, come near to me, I pray you. And they did so. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But listen to what he says now. Do not be distressed 
or disheartened or vexed and angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me ahead of you to preserve your life. He realized when that dream came to fruition that the providence of God was to save the lives of not only his brother and father, but the Jewish people. God, they're the tribe, 12 tribes of Israel represented here. If they die, there's no 12 tribes. God is actually using him to save the 12 tribes of Israel for his purpose. Is this incredible, man? This is a guy being used, and you're in the middle of all this stuff, and you don't realize that there's something bigger, there's a bigger purpose than you realize for your own life that God is using you. And he uses all of us for greater purposes than we really realize. Man, that just blessed my heart, man, when I read this. Joseph brings him near. Don't be distressed. Don't be disheartened. And then he says, God has sent me ahead to preserve life. Verse 6, for these two years the famine has been in the land, and there's still five more years in which this famine, there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And listen to verse 7, and God sent me before you to preserve for you a posterity and a continue a remnant. There's the remnant of God's people being spared because this young man was going to have to go through some trials to be used by God for a greater purpose. Could you imagine now realizing this purpose that God had is so much bigger than you've realized? You know, there's so many times that we're in a situation and it's not about us. It really isn't. There's times that we're going through things, even though we're experiencing it, it's really not about us. It's about God's plan in our life and about what he wants to do. Not all the time. Sometimes we make bad decisions and get ourselves jammed up, right? Sometimes the devil's attacking us. But sometimes it's God's providence. God sent me to preserve you and continue a remnant on the earth to save your lives by a great escape and save for you many survivors. Now think about this, that Joseph's life, he's going to have to go through a lot of trials, a lot of heartache. His heart was broken. I'm sure his soul was, man, so down at times when he was in this prison and going through all this. But for one man to go through all this to spare the lives of many, who's that a picture of? This guy's a type of Christ. There's so many correlations. When I read the story, I always look for Jesus. And so when you read the stories of the people's lives, always look for God. Moses as a deliverer. He's a type of Christ as a deliverer, right? The judges as a type of judge. Like, it just, it's so many threads, man, that man could never write this book. Man can't even write a newspaper article without retracting it the next week. And here we have 66 books in perfection without question, the, the word of God. So he says, he sent me here, but, uh, excuse me, so now it, is, it, it was not you who sent me here. This is in verse 8. But God, you think it was you. It was God. Remember, as he made me a father to Pharaoh, and a lord of all his house, and a ruler over all the land of Egypt. Think how this would blow their mind, because they were supposed to be being in captivity, and he goes there and becomes a leader. Only God, right? He says, hurry and go up to my father and tell him, your son Joseph says this to you. God has put me in charge of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. You will live in the land of Goshen. Remember, Goshen was the land that wasn't touched during the ten plagues. Remember that? When all the Jews in Goshen, when the death and the cattle and all that stuff died, none of it hit Goshen. God separated clearly the judgment from the unrighteous to the righteous. And you will be close to me and your children and your grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, and all of you. And there I will sustain and provide for you so that you and your household and all that yours may not come to poverty and want. For there are yet five more years of this uh, scarcity, hunger, and starvation of famine. Now notice your own eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin can see that I am talking to you personally in your language and not through an interpreter. And you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and all that you have seen and you will hurry and bring my father back to me or back here. Now think about this. When they first got the dream, when he first told them the dream, they, they got what? What did they get at, at Joseph? They got mad, they got angry, they got jealous, right? All the things you said? Okay. Why do you think they got mad, angry, and jealous? 
at Joseph? Pride? Pride? Be because he was going to be a, a ruler over them, right? So if they get prideful over him being a ruler over them, in their mind, how are they interpreting him being a ruler over them? You see where I'm going with this? In their mind, he's going to be this ogre ruler over them. When the whole time he was going to be used to save their life. Not being a ruler ogre like that. He was going to be used to save their lives. And they got mad and did all that they did on a false premise. Perception. Have you ever got mad at somebody because you perceived something and then you found out later you were wrong? Nobody in here, but you probably know somebody, right? <laughs> you, you all know somebody. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, right? You know, and I've, I've used the illustration before. Somebody says something and they're laughing. You think they're laughing at you. And, you know, and then you find out it has nothing to do with you. And I just thought about all the decisions they made were based on a false perception because they let pride and jealousy and anger dictate their response to a situation instead of allowing God to dictate their response to the situation. Remember, they're believers. These aren't unbelievers. They're believers that did this. Hallelujah. Help us, Jesus. Again, I was blessed by Joseph's words. And Joseph, what blew me away too was Joseph was trying to comfort them. Like, don't be upset. You know, it's okay. Like he's, he's comforting them. You know, in all the emotions, you can imagine he was going through. Don't be upset with yourselves. What's that? <laughs> Basically, what he said. I was thinking today, you know, I was, I was sitting praying and, and, and for the word. I had already laid out the word, but I, I like praying over it and over it and over it. And as I was praying, I was thinking about forgiveness and about that whole 20 to 21 years, they're living in turmoil, but Joseph was living in freedom. He was the one sold into slavery, but he was the one that was free. And he wasn't free. The reason he was free was because he forgave. So what could anybody do to him? He had a heart of forgiveness. But the brothers are walking around with a guilty conscience all this time. They're in turmoil, but Joseph's not in turmoil at all. And, and a lot of people get, get upset when you tell, you know, forgive, and they go, well, you don't know what they did to me, or if they did what they did to me. And, you know, and I understand, man, there are some horrible things that have happened to people. I've had things happen to me, you know, some things you don't share all your testimony. You don't want to, right? Not comfortable with it. But knowing that, you know, we've all had things happen, but forgiving someone, when someone's done something and that's sinful, wrong to you, you forgive them, the, the person you're setting free is yourself. Church, we can't set somebody else free. Only God can set somebody free. And so many people think, well, they're going to get away with it. They're not getting away with anything. You're actually letting them make you a victim over and over and over again. You were already a victim once. Why do you want to stay a victim? God will have you. God will guard you. When you forgive someone, you're actually handing them over to God. God's still going to deal with them. They still got to one day have a reckoning day with God, right? Come on. These 12 brothers, the 11 brothers, they didn't get away with nothing. Reckoning day came for them. But thankfully, the person they stood before had a heart of forgiveness. Now, forgiveness doesn't mean reconciliation all the time. You can forgive somebody from a distance. There are some people who have, have so much evil in them, you can't go pound around with them. But you can forgive them. You can release them. Let me put it this way. There can't be reconciliation until there's repentance. But there can always be forgiveness. You have the ability to forgive. You don't have the ability to make them be for, for, uh, repentive. So you hand them over to God. God has the ability to get them to the place of repentance. And once there's repentance, then there can be reconciliation. I'm not going to reconcile with somebody who has no repentance in their heart after they hurt me. I'm not a doormat, right? God didn't call me to do that. So, so what, what God was showing me today was forgiveness releases you. Repentance releases them. 
Come on, right? Amen. Praise God. Amen. God's, God's word, not mine. So, so yes. Yes. Amen. That's good, Mike. Yeah, the, the kindness of God or love of God leads us to repentance. So it's a good point, Mike. Again, another type of Christ, and he's showing this love, right? So when somebody's done something to you, and you and you have to, you want to, you know, God's asking or God's commanding us to forgive. He doesn't ask us; He commands us to forgive. He says, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven, right? So, so we ask, we 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 release them to God, right? I, you know, it's it's like in I in say like uh, I'll make it easy. Um, Either your marriage counseling or say you have a family member or there's some friction between people, right? And so, Lou, can you come here for a second? Just stand. I just want to illustrate this. So, so, so Lou, I'm trying to fix Lou, right? So Lou's got problems. I don't have any problems. I'm awesome. This dude's the problem. If it wasn't for him, I'd be even better, right? Am I talking to anybody? <laughs> so Lou's got issues. So I'm going to fix Lou. Now, you don't have to physically put your hands on him, but when you're always telling him what he's got to do, you're trying to be his Holy Spirit. You're trying to fix him. So as long as you, I, I need, uh, Diane, you can come here for a second. You're going to play God. Put your hand on him, okay? You're God. So now I'm going to fix Lou. When I put my hand on you, take yours off. Let's face this way. You're going to be God. She's got her hand on Lou. But I want to play Holy Spirit. So I'm going to tell him everything he's got to do. Who do you think can fix him better, God or you? Do you ever try to fix somebody? Anybody married? <laughs> you still married? <laughs> but you understand. Thank you. God bless you, man. You guys are awesome. Praise God. But, but you just, I try to get pictures in my mind because I used to do that. You know, you try to fix somebody. I, I tried to fix my wife. Couldn't do it, man. But you know, not that she needed fixing. She's the best wife in the whole wide world. Couldn't get a better wife. But when I went to God and I said, I mean, this is, I'm being honest. I was like, God, you, you got to do something with that woman. Like, you know what I'm talking about, Miss Shirley? I said, God, you got to do something with that woman. You know what God told me? Now I got to do something with you. He said, you're not her Holy Spirit. I'm her God. He said, I gave you to her. I gave her to you for you to be a steward of. Who do you think you are? And he said, if you let me fix you, I'll fix the situation. Right? So I had to humble myself and I started praying and, and warring. And God taught me that whole thing. When you have a spouse and something's wrong, instead of putting them down, you got to go to war for them. If there's something they're caught up in, you got to go to war for them. If you ain't going to war for them, who will? Right? You got a loved one, a family member caught up in drugs, whatever it may be. And listen, you got to do tough love. You got to protect. You got to do certain things. We understand that. It's, it's not they do whatever they want. But my God, we can war in prayer for them. We got to war for their souls, right? And if we don't, who will? You think the devil won't? <laughs> don't count on him. He's trying to destroy them, and you too. But Joseph realized at 17 years, what blows my mind is he's 17 years old. Man, I'm, I'm, and I still ain't figured it out right all the way. <laughs> but at 17, this guy, this kid has a heart like Jesus, like God to forgive. And I said, Lord, help, help me to have that same heart. <sighs> Joseph here gets to see the fulfillment of God's plan for why he went through all that he did. You ever been in a trial, man, and you didn't understand it? You come out of it, and, and everything turns around, and everything's good now, but you still don't understand why that happened? And then sometimes, like 10 years later, something happens, and you realize that's what that was for. It's like the light goes on, you know, the heavens open up, man, and you're like you're glowing, you need, people need sunglasses to look at you, you know what I'm saying? It's like, but you've been on that mountain, right? But sometimes we don't know the end. And we may not know it until we get to heaven, right? Sometimes we will, but other times we may not. So here's Joseph, because he held on to God, he's reunited with his brothers and remembered 
They've represented, again, the 12 tribes. It's so encouraging to my faith to see how God's providence is, is, is protecting. God is protecting his people. God, how many details had to be done for Joseph to fulfill everything that he did to save their lives? Well, how many details do you think God's setting up to spare our lives, to protect us as the, his church, his bride? So it, just faith, it just builds my faith. So when I see what's going on, I, I have peace. I really do. I get angry sometimes, but I got peace. Now the brothers go and tell their father that Joseph is alive. So let's go look at that in verse, uh, chapter 45, verses 27 and 28. But when they told Jacob all the words of Joseph, which he had said to them, and when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry them, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. It says warmth and life returned to him. Oh, man. You imagine, and I, we have a lot of people in our body who lost children, and, and my heart breaks, and we pray all the time, and, but I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. But could you, could you imagine somebody who thinks they lost a child, and then the child is actually alive? They, wind up, they find them alive. You think of some of these people who, whose children are lost, and, and the, you know, their search parties go out, and days and days and days, and they can't find, and then they're thinking, no, it's so many days, he's probably gone, he's dead, you know, maybe a child, and then they wind up finding the child. I mean, you can imagine, the man, the emotional roller coaster. And Jacob said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Could you imagine, man? The, the, what's going on with this guy? He had to be a little skeptical, maybe, right? Well, you know the devil's going to try to do that. So let's go see when they're reunited. Genesis 46, 1 through 5. So Israel made his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba, a place holy and sacred, has, a place hallowed by sacred memories. Do you remember Jacob, with the story of Jacob's ladder? Do you remember that story, anybody? Remember when Esau was chasing Jacob? He was going to kill him? He thought he was going to kill him? And he laid his head on the rock, and he began to pray, and he met God, and he wrestled with the angel. Remember the story? And he knocked his hip out. This is the place, Beersheba. So jo jo Jacob, on his way back, he's now actually named Israel too. He's on his way back, or he's on his way to Egypt. But on the way to Egypt, he stops in Beersheba, the place where he met and wrestled with God. And he offered sacrifices to God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to get down to Egypt, for I will there make of you a great nation. This is the covenant that was made with Abraham that went to Isaac and Jacob, right? I mean, do you see all these things that are tied together in this story? is just amazing. And I will go, listen to what God says, I'm going to go with you to Egypt, and I will surely bring you and your people Israel up and out again, and Joseph will put his hand upon your eyes where they are about to, to close in death. He tells him, your, your, your life's not much longer. Your son's going to place his hand on your eyes. You'll see your son. So Jacob arose and set out from Beersheba, and Israel's sons conveyed their father and their little ones and their wives in the wagons that Pharaoh has sent to take them. So here he is, and he's going to, he first meets with God in this place that he met with God. And remember the, the ladder and the dream and the angels descending upon heaven and down? And, and he speaks to him and reunites. Jacob is reunited with his brother Esau. And now you're going to see this reunification with his son, Genesis 46. I'm going to get down to verse 29, just for time's sake. Then Joseph made ready his chariot and went to meet Israel, his father, in Goshen. And he presented himself and gave distinct evidence of himself to him that he was Joseph. And each fell on other's neck and they wept on their neck a good while. Man, what a, what a beautiful picture of a son, a son fulfilling the calling that he had and then being reunited with his father. Who else did that happen to? Jesus. Jesus was separated from the father, went through all the trials, was basically thought was, was killed, but then resurrected and reunited back with his father in heaven. Do you see the pictures, man, that are, that are painted here? It's so amazing 
that the scripture is so perfect, man. And I, and I see this, this, this reconciliation because he was willing to forgive that God used this to, to reconcile a whole family, man. This family was dysfunctional. Anybody got a dysfunctional family? <laughs> Anybody the dysfunctional one? <laughs> this guy's good. <laughs> Can I hear it? Amen. But this, this reunification of this whole family, man, because somebody was willing to forgive. And then somebody repented because of that forgiveness extended. And it's really a picture of Jesus returning to the Father after enduring the cross to save others, right? But also for all of us one day, we're going to be reunited with our Father and all of our brothers and sisters, man, that went before us, our family members. There's going to be that, that great reunification, man, in heaven. The, it's called the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? We're all going to be together again, man, once and for all in heaven. Matthew 24, 13 and I was thinking about him, it says, but he that endures till the end shall be saved. Joseph endured, man. He endured the hardships of this world and he got rewarded mightily of God. And he became a picture of Christ. Now Jacob passes and, and the brothers, Jacob and the brothers fear, saying Joseph will now repay. What, what happens later is, I kind of just fill you in because we're out of time, but his, the brothers, when, when the father is going to pass, and the brother said, once dad dies, J Joseph's going to take revenge. He's just not doing it because he doesn't want to break God's heart. Right? That's what they're thinking now. So we're going to go up to Genesis 50, 15 through 20. This will be the last scripture that I read. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly repay us for all the evil that we did to him. And they sent a messenger to Joseph saying, your father did command before he died saying, so shall you say to Joseph, forgive I pray thee now the trespass of thy brethren and the sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray, forgive the trespass of your servants, of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. It wasn't in his heart. But I believe he wept because there was repentance. They're now, for the first time, asking for forgiveness. Help us, Jesus. Let it not take that point for us to get there. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face and said, Behold, we be thy servants. Now they're willingly submitting to the plan and the dream that he was now given. 30, 40 years later, man, the fullness of this comes to fruition. But listen to what he says in 20, and then we're going to pray. But as for you, you, Joseph said to them, Fear not, for I am in the place of God. Joseph said, It doesn't matter what you've done to me. I know I'm in the place of God. And when you know you're where God has you, nothing can get to you, man. And then he says, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. To bring it to pass as this day, to save much people alive. Is that awesome, man? Hallelujah. Father, we just pray right now. Lord, words, I don't even have words in my heart, God. Because it's such a beautiful picture of you and your heart and your love for us. That, God, your heart breaks, Lord. You just want us to, to, to come and, and repent of our sins and, and, and forgive others like we've been forgiven so you can reconcile. And so, Father, I pray that if there's any, any unforgiveness, God, in any of us for anything, I pray, any oughts, God, that we just lay them down at your feet right now and say, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord. And, Lord, we forgive those who have hurt us. We forgive those who have done some horrible things to us. And we, we today, Lord, we declare our freedom. And we hand them over to you. Lord, they're your children. You do what you want with your servant. So God, I thank you, Lord. The freedom that comes into our hearts when we can do that. And Lord, you're not doing that because you're mean. Lord, you're doing it because you want to see us free. You want to see our hearts free, Lord. You want to see us walking in joy and peace. And you're inviting us closer to you every day. So, Lord, I pray that we'll be like Joseph. I pray that we'll be a people that remain faithful to you, that we realize that we're also being given the gift of life. And I'm going to close with this. We're being built by God. 
for his purposes, for his glory. So, Father, we thank you and love you. Give travel and mercies. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said amen and amen. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I pray you enjoyed that series and pray for me. To, I'll hear God for the next one.